Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's lecture. I'm Joe Helbley. I'm the Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to greet you and welcome you to the 2017 Visionaries in Technology Lectureship of the Thayer School of Engineering. This is a lectureship that was created as an annual event in 2011 to honor engineers and scientists whose insights have, and I quote in our founding language, benefited humanity through revolutionary engineering solutions, paradigm shifting scientific advances, development of novel fields of inquiry, or policy shaping debate. This is a lectureship whose organization has been intentionally and deliberately a little bit unusual from the start. We invite our junior faculty colleagues, our tenure track assistant professors, to form a committee each year and about 18 months in advance identify scientific and engineering thought leaders whom we would like to have join us for an afternoon of discussion, debate, and conversation with our students and with our faculty and staff colleagues in the Thayer community. This is a program that has welcomed student engagement from the start. I hope some of you have had a chance to see some of the posters of student work displayed throughout the building in honor of this event. Event. There is also an annual tradition where each year a faculty student team craft a unique gift for our speaker, representative of that speaker's work, and we will present that to today's speaker at the end of the lecture. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the 2017 Visionaries in Technology Distinguished Lecturer, and that is Dr. Arun Majumdar, who is the J. Precourt Professor at Stanford University. He's a member of the faculty of the Departments of Mechanical Engineering and, by courtesy, Material Science and Engineering, and he is co-director of Stanford, Stanford's Precourt Institute for Energy. Dr. Majumdar's research has involved the science and engineering of nanoscale materials and devices, particularly in the areas of energy conversion, transport, and storage, as well as in the area of biomolecular analysis. His current work focuses on looking at electrochemical reactions for thermal energy conversion, thermochemical water splitting reactions to produce carbon-free hydrogen, understanding the limits of heat transfer in nanostructured materials, and a new effort to simply re-engineer the electricity grid. In October 2009, Dr. Majumdar was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the US Senate to become the founding director of the Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy, known to many of us as ARPA-E, where he served until June 2012 and helped ARPA-E become a model of excellence within the government supported in a bipartisan fashion to develop and promote cutting edge and novel energy solutions and help transfer them to the private sector. Between 2011 and 2012, he also served as Acting Undersecretary of Energy in the U.S. Department of Energy. After leaving Washington, D.C. in 2012, before joining Stanford, Dr. Majumdar was the Vice President for Energy at Google. Now, earlier in his career, before being called to Washington, Dr. Majumdar was the Maynard Chair Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science at the UC University of California, Berkeley, and also, in that capacity, the Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and the Environment at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is a bachelor's degree graduate in mechanical engineering of IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and holds a PhD from UC Berkeley in 1989. And let me simply say, in closing my introductory remarks, I had the Great pleasure a few years ago being seated next to Dr. Majumdar at a dinner in Washington, D.C., and we had the opportunity throughout the course of an evening to discuss his service as an academic, his service in the private sector, and most recently, his service standing up a new agency within the federal government focused on developing energy solutions. It was a broad-ranging conversation. He's had a fascinating career working on many important issues that are relevant to us here at the Thayer School of Engineering. I'm sure you will enjoy his lecture, and with that, I ask you to join me in welcoming him to the stage here at Thayer. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Dean Heldley. Can you hear me at the back? Very good. Um, thank you for that very nice and warm and long introduction. Um, <laughs> it's such an honor to be here. This is my first time here in Hanover and in, in Dartmouth, and I can just, uh, just with one day of exposure to the students in particular and to the faculty, uh, to see the wall of patents and to get into the labs and see what the kids are doing, whether they're making things uh, with 3D printing or this formula hybrid car that I just saw. It is just absolutely amazing. And, and I just wish I was a student back again uh, and as an undergraduate student out here. And it's, it sounds like a lot of fun. So thank you for inviting me out here, uh, having me come here, and then, you know, just, uh, just an honor to be here. Um, I thought I'll give my views of where the energy field is today, as opposed to go deep in a particular scientific or engineering area. Um, I thought I'll, I asked my, uh, the faculty colleagues out here last night over dinner what I should talk about. And what I gathered was sort of the broad view of energy, as well as some of the innovations that are happening today to address probably one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces today. And I call it the, the turbulence of the global energy system because it is a bumpy ride. It's going to be a bumpy ride for the next two to three decades, at least, maybe longer, for the industry. The industry is being shaken up uh, like nothing before, and I'm going to say a little bit. And the question is, how do you navigate? And the navigation comes through ideas, comes through innovation. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But before I do that, I think it's very important to understand where have we come from before we go ahead. And I take you back to about 250 years ago when the United States was being created, when the founding fathers were writing the, the famous documents in a, such a thoughtful way. Um, and at that time, life used to be something like this. You were traveling uh, through, through um, horse carriages. This is a picture. There's a photograph. Of course, there were no photographs at that time. That's where you had paintings. Um, that was a way to move around. That was mobility. And the way to light was using whale oil. This was in the 1700s. And from that, we have come to this. We use 300 horses to take us to the grocery store. <laughs> And I use 100,000 horses to travel across the continent and come here. And instead of that, we have lighting. And this is using the electricity grid. And the discovery of electricity and the use of electricity was called the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And this, we wrote an article on this, Steve Chu and I, which we call this industrial revolution to be going from horsepower to horsepower. And that's what the transformation has been. And our founding fathers who lived in this kind of, who led this kind of a lifestyle, I don't think would imagine, could imagine the lifestyle that we have out here. This was one of the most remarkable periods of human ingenuity in transforming a life in 250 years, which in the history of humankind is a blink of an eye. And I don't think the history of humankind has changed this much right now. In fact, I'm writing a book right now on the history of energy and, and, and put ARPA-E in that context. And if you really look at the long history of humankind, this is such a short time. And here we are. And this is so what is important is not just both evolutionary. Uh, both are important, evolution and transformative solutions. And I think we are in another period of time right now, which is why it's so exciting to be a student right now, because your careers are ahead of you, that we are another period of transformation that is happening, which is why it is a turbulent ride right now. It's a bumpy ride. So, so this, this is the transformation. You had a snapshot out there. This is the snapshot today. What about anything in between? And I call these the age of global exponentials. So you have global per capita GDP increase exponentially from about in the 1700s out here uh, go up. And this is 
often GDP is measured as a measure of prosperity. It's not the only measure, but it is one of the measures, and you can see how that has gone up. And it has enabled, it's been enabled by the use of energy. The Industrial Revolution is all about how we source, distribute, and use energy. And, and as you can see, this is mostly fossil-based energy, which is readily available and fairly inexpensive. And that is, of course, now giving rise to the CO2 concentration in the air, um, in the atmosphere. And so this is a good thing. This is a bad thing. This has been caused by that. And the question is, how do we continue doing that without doing that? <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, but what is also important to note is the population. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were 700 million people in the world. Right now, we are about seven plus billion people. By the middle, or by the end of this century, the uh, United Nations projects the population to be 10 billion, and you can see the error bar is 10 billion as well. And so it really depends on the fertility of women in Africa. That's where the growth of the population is really going to be. And so we are entering this period, and the question is, how do we provide energy to all the human beings in the world, and not just the energy, but all the other amenities in the lifestyle that we lead, and still reduce this concentration of atmospheric um, CO2? And we have to do something about here. So energy and climate are intimately related in this. So that's the world that we face. In another, so this is not, these are global averages. Let's talk about global distribution. So this is the population density in the world today. We are over here somewhere. Um, and you can see the population around the world, the high densities in, in Asia. And you have population growing mostly out here and out here, mostly growing out here. The only way our pop the population in Europe increases is by immigration, frankly. And, but the most of the population growth is going to be out here. And if you overlay on top of that, that lighting picture, what emerges is the following. The United States is very bright. We need to make it brighter in a sustainable way. Um, but you can see a mismatch. There are many parts of the world where there's a red patches, but they haven't turned on the lights, literally. And one of the big challenges of the world is how do we, we need to enable people to turn on the lights, but in a sustainable way. How do we do that? So if you look at the world, the big challenges that our, our community, our, our humanity faces, there are three big challenges. Challenge number one, how can we decarbonize cost effectively? There's an economic factor to it because energy touches everything that we do. So economics are important. How can we decarbonize cost effectively and continue the economic growth for all people? Okay, that's number one. Number two, how can we provide access to affordable modern energy to every human being in the world? This is, in the 21st century, access to energy ought to be a human right. Because if you don't, they will remain in the stratum of, technology, of, of society where they can never get out. They will always have to hunt around for wood sticks and all to run their lives. And that is not the world that we want to see happen. And number three, how can we make energy system resilient, adaptable, and secure against various threats, whether it's um, climate threats or cyber threats, et cetera? So if that's, if that's the world we're entering, this is the picture we have today. This is the geographical distribution, the spatial distribution. And you have, I showed you the trends. I showed you the, where we want to go. Let's see what are the trends going on in the world that will affect the energy system. One big trend, which is unmistakable and doesn't really matter what we do in the United States or in a few other places elsewhere or in pockets of the OECD countries, is this massive trend of urbanization. And if you look at the population of the world going, uh, going up right now, and as I said, by the end of the century to 10 billion, by the middle of the century to about 9 billion, the growth of the rural population will remain flat most of the population growth is going to be in urban areas because that's where the jobs are. That's where the economies are growing. Economic development is happening. And that's where energy is needed. So you can Im imagine that if this is going to go up, the energy demand in the urban regions, which is the electricity grid and others, are going to go up. 
So this is a massive change that is going on. And urban design, whether it's energy, water, other utilities, will be a major issue. How fast is this growing? Well, if you look at the growth rate, these large big circle are the mega cities, which are 10 million people or more. Uh, these are the five to the pink or the purple out here is five to 10 million, green is one to five million, and this is less than, this is 500 to 1,000 to 1 million. You can see the growth rates in Asia and Africa. These are reaching rates of about six to 8% per year. Six to 8% growth rate per year. I can bet you that this is not planned. This is unplanned growth going on because it's very hard to plan for that kind of growth rate. And the question that we have is that despite the unplanned nature of what's going on, how can we still provide affordable access to energy that is secure and all the challenges that we have? And you know, this is the infrastructure the problem that we will have. The other trend, and these are energy trends that are going on, that have transformed uh, what the energy world in the last decade, because 20 years ago, no one had expected these to happen. One is the big shale revolution that, is go that has happened in the United States. We are, if you look at North America, we have between Canada, Mexico, and United States, we have uh, enough hydrocarbon resources to be self-sufficient. And in terms of a national security, we are blessed that we really don't need to depend on the rest of the world in terms of energy resources. And of course, for renewable, we have the resources as well. And this kind of an energy independence is a major factor in our geopolitics and our security. So that's what's happened. And the price, the pri this is price of natural gas. It's at about you know, two to four dollars a million BTU. In fact, natural gas is a byproduct of the real value, which is oil and it is often flared. North Dakota looks really bright, not because there are people there, but because of the flaring. And, and so this is going on, and you can see the price differential. Uh, in a Japan, it's about 16 or $15 a million BTU. So there is now we're entering an area of massive LNG trading, liquefied natural gas trading, where they're making, some of these companies are making big bets, being able to move natural gas so that you can not only provide energy access, but you can get off coal and other polluting sources of energy. So this is a world that we're entering, just like we had oil transportation or oil tankers, we'll have LNG tankers that are now being starting to deploy. This is a major shift that we did not anticipate. When, when we went to, the, went to the, when I joined the government in 2009, we were out here and we're seeing this happen, but we didn't, we didn't quite believe it uh, to happen this kind of an effect. And this is really the last 10 years, this has transformed the whole energy landscape. The other noteworthy trend is this one of that of renewables. This is wind, and you can see the price of, this is a contract price, the cost is lower. These are actual business contracts that have been signed that are public data. And uh, you know, in about 2009 or so, it was right around here, and it has come down to the point that it's approaching about $20 a megawatt hour. I just got back from China about a month ago, and there they're claiming that at about nine meters per second, eight meters per second wind, they're gonna to get to two cents or $20 a megawatt hour without any subsidies. That's the world we're entering. And this is solar coming down. And those of you who are working in this field know that there's enough headroom out there to increase the efficiency and bring down the full overall cost of solar panels. In fact, the panel cost is actually quite low compared to the full install installation cost today. So efficiency really matters. And there's headroom out there for increasing the efficiency. So you can see that this is coming down. The capacity growth around the world is going up exponentially. And you find that you're cutting some bands. It is getting cheaper than natural gas, US natural gas and China coal. And, and this is US coal and nuclear. And so in terms of levelized cost of electricity, so you can find that the wind and solar, this is the first time in history that renewable carbon-free electricity is getting to be the cheapest way to produce electricity uh, at scale and, and anywhere in the world. I mean, hydroelectric used to be there, but that's limited to certain regions. This you could do pretty much in many, many places in the world. So this is, you know, people are trying to get their head around this. What does that really mean 
in terms of using, can the oil and gas industry that needs energy as well, can it utilize carbon-free electricity and thereby decarbonize? These are questions that the oil and gas industry are trying to grapple with today. The other trends that are going on is the cost of batteries, again, over the last decade. I remember in 2008 going to Tesla. And that time, you know, Elon Musk used to be sitting in a desk like this, and we would just sit down and chat. Nowadays, you can't do that with him. Um, but you know, at that time, the cost of batteries, uh, when they started, when Tesla started, was about $800 to $900 a kilowatt hour. Today, if you go for a battery pack in China or even in Tesla, internal cost probably is going to be on the order of about $150 a kilowatt hour battery pack. And in Nevada, we're building a gigafactory. In China, they're building two gigafactories. And so this cost, we can see the glide path of this coming down towards about $100 a kilowatt hour. And when the battery pack cost goes down to $100 a kilowatt hour, the range as well as the cost becomes competitive with gasoline-based cars. And so now you'll see the penetration of EVs coming into the, electric, in, into the transportation sector. And now many countries are announcing, India just announced, they're not going to sell any gasoline cars after 2030. Uh, France did that as well. I think some other cities in China and all are doing that. So I think we're going to see a major influx of electric vehicles into the, uh, into the market, into consumers. And I think uh, GM just announced they're going to produce 20 models of electric vehicles, which is pretty amazing. So we are seeing this happen. This is, again, over the last 100 years, we've been relying on gasoline-based cars, and now we are seeing a major transformation happening. The other one that is not always talked about is, is the following, is LEDs. And this is the cost. This is, in fact, even a steeper curve where LED costs have been coming down, driven primarily, the technology driven primarily by televisions. And now it's, being, it's affecting the, the lighting industry in a very positive way to the point that if you go to Amazon today, you can buy an LED which is cost competitive, almost cost competitive with CFLs. I'm not talking about the dimmable ones, but just the, you know, the dumb ones. It's about you know, cost competitive with CFLs. And there's headroom out here because most of the cost is in the packaging. And so if the packaging costs come down, all of these costs are going to come down. And so this is an amazing transformation that is happening in the energy world. What are the other trends that are going on that will affect the energy world, but are not perceived directly to be in the energy world today? Well, here's another one. Digitization. We are seeing a 50-fold growth from 2010 to 2020 in terms of bytes that are being produced, stored, or used. 50-fold. And the cost, the total investment is going up, but the cost per gigabyte is coming down. Storage is almost getting to be free. Processing is, is changing. New kinds of chips for machine learning are being developed. And this digital world is intersecting furiously with the, with the energy world, whether it's oil and gas industry or whether it is the electricity industry. And we are going to see more and more of this. And I'll come to some details of that in a few minutes. So if you step back for a moment and look at all these trends that are going on and ask, how do these trends intersect? What is, you know, what's going to happen? Of course, there are lots of unanswered questions. But it is fair to say that if you talk to the people in the industry, ones who have been around for a long time, um, it is the global energy system is really at a tipping point of a major transformation. And it is because of three Ds. I call this the 3D effect, to summarize all of this. One is to drive to decarbonize. Global, you know, there's a, the reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the issue about climate change, frankly, is not a debate anymore. If you go to the industry, it's not a debate. They're looking for solutions. It may be a debate in some circles in Washington, D.C., but even that is doubtful. Okay? It, but it is people are looking for solutions today. And, and that because they know after Paris, Paris... It took 21 meetings to acknowledge there's a problem. Okay? But now that it has been acknowledged, they know where this vector is pointing. And there are people, industries looking for solutions. So that's the first D. The second one is the digital 
uh, world is intersecting. And that's going to introduce, we are at the early days of a major revolution in automation. And, and that's the digital world entering, not in Snapchat and, and Instagram, which is fantastic, but this is going to enter in the physical infrastructure. And of course, that brings up issues of cyber, et cetera. So that's the second thing in terms of increasing efficiency and reducing cost. And the third one is, broadly speaking, this diversification. Whether it's transportation or whether it's the grid, which is used to be centralized, now it's getting decentralized, et cetera. So these are the three Ds that are transforming. These are the changes that are happening that are transforming the global energy system. And by the way, did I ever mention that this is the largest industry in the world? It's $10 trillion per year, order of magnitude. Leave plus minus $1 trillion, okay? Um, that's the largest industry in the world which is undergoing this transformation right now. It's a once in a hundred year transformation that is happening. So when I said I really wish I was a student, I really meant it. Because that gives you both challenges as well as opportunities. And challenges for an engineer is opportunity. And so, you, because we are problem solvers. So if you really look at now looking forward, what is needed? What do we need to do? And what are the opportunities? What are some examples of things that can be done? Broadly speaking, um, I'll show you, I, I, I'll tell you what I think we need, and I'll show you some examples of that. What we need is innovation writ large. And what does that mean? This is the overused words. Well, let me explain this. You certainly need some breakthroughs, uh, evolutionary uh, improvement, as well as revolutionary breakthroughs using science and engineering. But it is not just science and engineering. That has to connect with the business world. That has to connect with the economics, with this market design or others. We need to align that with the regulatory side, the laws. Also, look at finance, how we finance, because this is a $1 trillion industry. And if that's going to change, it will require investments. What are the criteria? What are the things that we need to do for that money to flow? And finally, it has to have social acceptance. So this is, and this is technology, this is where science and engineering mostly focuses on, but we got to align all of this, and I call this aligned innovations, because you got to all align them, because if they're fighting with each other, then what you will do is like driving a car with one foot on the accelerator, the other foot on the brake. There'll be friction, and we want to minimize friction and align them, which is why it is so important for scientists and engineers who sit around here to understand the rest of the thing and bring a holistic view on approach to innovation. And I think Dartmouth is very well placed because it's a liberal arts school and you have an engineering school to be able to do that. And I'll show you a few examples of that as well. So if that's what is needed, and this is what I say, inspired policy can really reinforce and accelerate progress. So what do we need to do? I think we in terms of evolutionary things, we, need, we know that we have to improve the lithium-ion battery. We've got to improve, go down some learning curves and get better and better. Solar learning curve, power electronics learning curve, and I'll show you some examples of that. But we need a few other ideas that will create totally different learning curves. Let me give you an example. And this is one of the things that we focused on at ARPA-E. And, and people ask, what's the purpose of RPE? What did we really look for? Let me explain that. In any technology, you have what is called a learning curve. That means over time and scale, something, any technology becomes cheaper and the performance improves. So if you take the ratio of cost to performance, it generally goes down over time, okay? And that's a good thing. And this is, you know, this is your horse carriage. And if you want to improve a technology, you can make better and better wheels, better wheel bearing, stronger horses, long-lasting horses, et cetera, okay? And you can do that, and it's important to do that. The purpose of ARPA-E was to create entirely new learning curves where you take shots at goal early on where may some of them will fail. Like, look at these are the cars that were made, steam-powered cars, Benz motor wagon, which were too expensive, but they, but they took shots at this goal, and somewhere along the line, 
you know, Henry Ford figured out I can reduce the cost and I can reduce the cost by assembly line manufacturing. And so that this line eventually won out of that competition and became cheaper and better and cleaner than this kind, the, this kind of technology. And within a few, within a decade, it just basically disrupted the whole technology. And the goal of ARPA-E was to create the disruption inside the United States than having it come from the outside. Okay, this is going to be a competitive world, and this was the idea is to create the learning curves. But if you hadn't started this, you would never have a shot of that. So the, our role of ARPA-E was to create entirely new learning curves that would be cheaper, better, cleaner than what was done before. And one of the, the some of the books that were must read when they, anyone came into ARPA-E was the following. This is the book by Andy Grove called Only the Paranoid Survive. Okay, and this was during his time when Intel was only almost going under in the 1980s and he turned that around from a memory making company to a processor making company and that was a major shift that he had to strategically figure out what to do. And today's energy companies are in that strategic inflection point. They're trying to figure out what the strategy is and frankly, they don't really have one, many of them. The second book was Alchemy of Air. And this is a very interesting book, and I got into this because I wanted to figure out what was the most important invention or innovation of the 20th century. And we would think that it's you know, airplanes and cars or internet and things like that, and it turned out none of these. The most important invention innovation was about how do you take atmospheric nitrogen and make ammonia which were the precursors for fertilizers that grew food so that we could live. And that nitrogen from the air that is in the, what is in the ammonia is in the nitrogen in all of us out here in our proteins and DNA. And that's the, the most impactful embedded system I've ever known. And that was the story of the alchemy of air. And it's an amazing story of Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch and how they created the technology, how they scaled it. So this was the must read, and our goal was to create that for the energy technologies, really change the way. And the impact of that, by the way, is the following. This is New York City in 1900. This is uh, about 100,000 horses were in New York City, 1,200 tons of manure per day, 100,000 liters of urine per day, and that was the, these, this was the crap around there in New York City, and people had to clean up every day. And this is 1900, this is 1913, 1913, 1908 was Ford Model T, and you can't find a horse. This was the transformation that happened in a matter of a decade. And I think we are looking at some of that transformation happening again. So if you ask me, a lot of people ask me, okay, so what are the technologies? Now that we have painted this picture and there are challenges and opportunities, what would we do in terms of technology? Technology is important. It's not the only thing, as I mentioned. You need the business, you need the finance, you need the re regulatory framework, et cetera. But if someone asks, what are those revolutionary technologies that you would need to really address this massive global challenge? And I'm going to invoke a very famous American philosopher in the name of David Letterman. <laughs> and, and those of you who uh, still remember David Letterman, uh, some of the youngsters may not. He had this top 10 things of game-changing energy efficiency in no particular order. He always, every day, he did this top 10. And so here's the top 10. This is my top 10. I think you should all have top 10s. And you know, we can compare notes and see whether they match up or not. I'll tell you my top 10, OK? And this is no particular order. Number 10, carbon capture from coal-fired power plants at less than $30 a ton of CO2 or directly from air at less than $150 a ton. This is very hard. And we don't know how to do this yet. But if you could do this, it would make a big, big difference. And this is not so much for the United States, but certainly for China and India. In the United States, the coal is being displaced by natural gas. But in other parts of the world, it is not being displaced. So if you could do that, this would be amazing. Number nine, photovoltaic systems that are lighter and more efficient, enabling fully installed capital cost of less than half a dollar per watt. Today, or when we were in DOE, we created something called the SunShot initiative. And that was to say that by the end of this decade, the fully installed cost is going to be a dollar a watt. And this was 2010 when we said that. And at that time, people said that you guys are crazy. And this is too bold. We said, let's try it. And this year, 
there was a, a system installed in the United States at a, at a dollar a watt, fully installed. And so we did it before the end of the decade. And so the goal is, can we get to this? Because if you get to that, the levelized cost of electricity is going to be two and a half, less than two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And it opens up other things that we perhaps don't think about. Desalination of water or water purification, um, turning CO2 into oil. You need the energy cost is going to be very, very important. And so this is going to be, if you could do this, this would be amazing. Number eight, battery storage at a capital cost of less than $100 a kilowatt hour for more than 1,000 cycles, or for seasonal storage, less than $10 a kilowatt hour. That's what you need for seasonal storage. And if you have high penetration of renewables, you will need that seasonal storage. Number seven, modular nuclear plant construction at a capital cost of less than $3 a watt. This is very important. We are the largest source of carbon-free electricity today is nuclear. And it is too expensive. That's why we're not building any nuclear plants. We got to reduce the cost and make it small and modular. Number six, deep borehole carbon-free geothermal energy at that cost. Geothermal is nuclear without the waste problem, OK? <laughs> and so if you could do this, this will be amazing. If you could, and this is not just for the United States. This is worldwide. Number five, low-cost grid integration for intermittent renewables at greater than 50% penetration more like 80% penetration. I'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, number four, building energy efficiency. Zero net building. A lot of people talk about zero net building. Zero net building at zero net cost. How about that? And if you could do that, it will be transformational. Um, internal combustion engines, we're going to use them at more than 50% efficiency with multi-fuel uh, options. Store carbon-free energy into fuels at less than $2 or a gallon, or two to three dollars a gallon of gasoline equivalent, okay? And finally, rewiring crops to induce negative emissions and increase food productivity. I obviously won't have time for discussing all of these, but I'll discuss this, these three, and um, you know, I'll, I'll try to get to the last two um, in a few minutes. Let me talk about the grid, because this is one of the most important infrastructures in our country and around the world. The architecture of the grid today, the architecture, not the devices, the architecture and the paradigm is still that of Tesla and Edison. I call this the Tesla Edison paradigm. And the idea was that large centralized generation, long distance high voltage transmission, medium voltage distribution in your neighborhood, and low voltage use. The generation, the power flowed only one way. There are millions of billions of loads out here, one way power flow. And the generation always track the load so that when you turn on the light out here, some generator ramps up. And the only way to communicate between the load and the generator was frequency. Because there were turbo machinery, you, you turn on the load, it slows down a little bit. And somewhere in the generator, people looked at 60 hertz, or it went to 59.9. And oh, we need to ramp it up to bring it to 60. It's a very simple control system that people use. That's how the grid you know, ran at that time, that's how the grid runs today. That's how they balance the grid in real time today. So this is the paradigm that we're living in. And in the United States, we're the first one, you know, first country to create the grid. And we have an amazing infrastructure of transmission and distribution system around the country. But let me tell you some challenges that, is, that we are facing today. You may have seen substation transformers like this that are going around, you know, across the country along highways and in a big substation. Let me give you some numbers. The age, average expected lifespan of these transformers is 40 years. The average age in the United States is 42. <laughs> we're aging, and we're, you know, it's minus two. And of course, not every, all of these are failing at the same time, but we are in this process of replacing, and it's an expensive process. So this is one of the big challenges that we face. The other challenges that we face are, you know, I'll, I'll show you. This is, we are trying to do this. We're trying to integrate a lot of renewables into the system at the, at the big, you know, utility scale, solar farms and wind farms. This is going on, and California wants to do 50% by 2030. Um, and there was a bill in, in our legislation of 100% by 2045. Uh, that failed, <laughs> and, and frankly, we, don't, we are trying to figure out the roadmap to get to 50% of 2030. So when you are 
introducing that kind of penetration because the grid was never designed for volatile generation like solar and wind. It was developed for slow turbine machinery. When you're trying to do things like this, then what happens is we are facing this today. It's called the California duck curve. I tell my Chinese friends we have a bigger export than you do. Instead of Peking duck, we have got California duck. <laughs> what is the duck curve? In the middle of the day, this is the plot of the net load. So if you take the total load and subtract what the solar provides, this is the net load that they have to provide. And what you find is that in the middle of the day when there's a lot of sun, the net load goes down. And then when the sun goes down, it ramps up. And this is the duck, and this is the neck, and this is the beak out here. And the duck is getting fatter and fatter. And in the middle of the day, you have a risk of overgeneration. This was the prediction by 2020. This is what we reached in 2016. We exceeded that. And then once you have this excess uh, overgeneration, then you get the ramp. And the ramp is really hard because people are going home, turning on the lights, and the sun is going down. And this is the ramp that is needed, 13,000 uh, megawatts, or so 13 gigawatts in three hours. This is an amazing amount of ramping that it needs to do. And today we are doing it with natural gas but that has carbon emissions. And if you really want to reduce carbon emissions, what do we do? Can we shift loads by storage? How many hours do we have to, how much will it cost? All those issues are now rolling around, okay? So major challenges when you're trying to redesign the grid. But there are some, there's some good news um, also. And so one of the things that the technology when we were in ARPA-E were focused on was power electronics. And I think some of the people out here got funded on that. So let me show you just one example of that. This is controlling power. Things that this was done. This is 8,000 pounds, 60 hertz distribution transformer, and it's a really a passive device. And what we were funding was a new generation of semiconductors, wide band gap semiconductors like this one out here. This is silicon carbide in a transistor that can handle power, 15 kilovolts, 100 amps, 50 kilohertz of chopping so that now you can build up the 60 hertz again. And this is potentially about 100 pounds or so, or maybe a little bit more. And this is the, so we kind of looked at this wide band gap semiconductors going to high frequency, which is going back to Tesla, high frequency, high voltage, and seeing if you could use this electronic way of doing AC to AC, AC to DC, DC to DC, DC to AC, et cetera. And there was a lot of progress in that that was made not just silicon carbide, but gallium nitride. These are some of the 3.5 semiconductors that are out there. And we have now uh, you know, a lot of technologies that are now being coming out of this investment that we made in the R&D. So if you really look back, look at the electricity side and see what's going on, this is what is going on. This is the, the power electronics. This is amazing stuff that is happening in terms of reducing, going to higher frequency, reducing the system level cost. Communication and control, I mean, this is a chip you can buy about $1.50, and it's, a, it's an amazing controller, a digital controller. You have sensing. Frankly, there's a lot of room for improvement in the sensing that we have. These are for the transmission system. This is for meters at home. A lot of cloud computing and distributed intelligence, what we normally call as Internet of Things, but that's essentially uh, you know, networked embedded systems, and cloud computing, and then data science. These are all getting cheaper and better, and we see that this is coming into the electricity world. And if you look at what's going on at the, not just at the generation, but in the demand end, this is what's gonna happen. If you look, project yourself, there'll be cars that are, that are connected to the cloud. In fact, if you, if you look at Teslas and all that, these are, and, or other vehicles, these are already connected. Software is getting uploaded at night, and they're getting upgraded, et cetera, right? So this is the world we're entering. You have these beautiful looking devices, which are nothing more than a switch, okay? <laughs> but they're networked, which means you can collect the data, you can, you can remotely switch it, you can aggregate in the cloud and turn on and off just by changing the thermostat level by one degree, you won't even know it, massive control on the loads. And this is new in many ways, and you have this happening as well. So if you put all that together, this is what we are seeing as grid as a system. This is the old system. This is the current system that we have. 
you have generation, you have transmission system, and when the transmission system crosses state boundaries, that's why it is regulated by the federal regulation, by something called FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Then the local distribution is done by a utility, which is normally, uh, in many cases, it's a regulated monopoly in a state. That is a state regulation. And the pricing, this is done by a wholesale market in this price. This is done, the price is regulated by utility commissioners. And then it gets to a meter and your home, and the jurisdiction of a utility stops at the meter. That's the world we have today. Now you put in, inject more than 50% of renewables with all kinds of duck curves and other things showing up, and you're doing this on behind the meter. So you got volatility at this end, and you got potential volatility at the other end. And because you can aggregate in the cloud, you can provide these services through the cloud to the wholesale market or to the utility. So this is the rewiring. This is the rewiring of the electricity system that is in process in the early days right now. And that is an amazing transformation that is happening. And this is not just a technical problem. So what we are doing at Stanford, we started an initiative last year, after about a year and a half of discussion on campus, is that let's do something that is holistic, looking at the whole picture. And this is the, it's an initiative called Bits and Watts. Um, and the data is gonna be very important, we know that. And what we are looking at is not just technology, but the understanding of markets, understanding of business models, regulation, finance, policy, institutions, all connected in a way that actually provides solutions to enable this decarbonization of the grid. And as I said, and this is done in collaboration with many of our industry partners, which is growing at an amazing rate. Now, I mentioned about data and what data can do what could not be done before. I'll show you one example. I've got to show some student examples. I'll show you one example that is happening. And, and this is a couple of students in less than a year that they, they did this. Um, you know, today, you can get Google Maps, essentially satellite imagery for free. You can get an API, and you can act, get access, and you can build applications on top of that. What these guys did is they developed a, a program, an algorithm based on deep learning called Deep Solar, where it is supervised learning, where they were able to identify uh, solar panels, and they and it essentially enabled to learn and get better and better and better at identifying solar panels. And so this is the algorithm, so you feed this, and you, you train it to d develop, you know, detect solar panels, any kind of solar panels, and then out pops the solar map, the solar heat map of where the GPS locations of all solar panels, you know, and this is the Bay Area, and you can see where the solar panels are. Here is San Francisco, okay, the peninsula, San Francisco out here, with lots of solar panels, but it's foggy. So it doesn't produce, it doesn't do much. Okay, it doesn't do much. People feel really good about it, but it doesn't do much. But that's what, that's what people, people have done that. You know, it's, and as, to the, as this year's economics Nobel Prize said, you know, people are not always rational, but they feel good about it. But nevertheless, they do that. And this is the solar irradiation map. This is the Bay Area. This is the Los Angeles area. And now, this is all of the United States. We know the solar panels, every solar panel in the United States, the GPS location and the size. Now, while that is good, I mean, what we can now do is given the real-time solar irradiation, we can find out how much is being generated, which substation needs to be tuned up or addressed, um, and that's the kind of thing that we can help utilities and all in planning on the future distribution networks, et cetera. And of course, we can correlate with income level and things like that to find out where are the solar panels being adopted mostly. And this is just a, less than a year's work of going on, and there's so much more in distributor controls on the technical side, and new market designs that need to be, new pricing models for the utility sector that needs to be done. And so we are in the early days of the transformation. Let me say a little bit about these two topics that I promised earlier, about how do you store carbon-free energy in the highest density battery you can get, which is fuels, at $2 or $3 a gallon, and how do you induce negative emissions? Let me tell you the origins of this. Um, in June of last year, 
so I used to be on Secretary Moniz's advisory board, and he asked us in June, right at the end of his term, um, he said, I have a question for you guys. He said, I, what are the R&D opportunities today to have a gigaton scale impact on CO2 through either negative emissions or CO2 utilization in the future? It's a very interesting question because we are talking about R&D, which is generally in the microton or nanoton range, okay, done in the labs out here and elsewhere. So he, he's asking the question, what should we do in the lab today that could have a gigaton scale impact in the future on negative emissions? Okay? And that's not a trivial question to answer. So we got a few people together. I think one of them, George, was one of your earlier uh, speakers in this series. And we put our minds together, and in five months, we came up with a report. And I'll just give you a gist of that report um, and some of the things that I see as opportunities. Because this is a very important question. Because if the emissions from our energy sector does not go down dramatically, we got to find other ways to do this. Because to reduce the CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 concentrations in the air. So what are the options we have? So this is, so one of the things I want to point out is that if you look at human emissions in terms of just gigatons of carbon, it's about 10 gigatons of carbon per year which relates to about 37 gigatons of CO2 per year, but 10 gigatons of carbon. Look how much comes in by photosynthesis every year. 123 gigatons of carbon, and about 120 goes back. Okay, that's the cycle, that's the carbon cycle in the, in the photosynthesis on land, and this is the carbon cycle in the oceans. And it is this net that is acidifying our oceans, and it is this this, this number is so big that it takes account of all of that and more, okay? So this is what is going on, and as you will see, what we looked at is looked at the natural and engineered carbon cycles and see if you could do something. So here are the recommendations we made. The, the first recommendation is that this is such a complex system, trying to do one thing at a time can lead to effects that are not so good in other parts. So you gotta take a systems view of the natural carbon cycle and the engineered carbon cycle. It is a very complex thing, and today's models are just not good enough. And so one of the research topics, and I won't even go through arrows, except to say there are lots of arrows, okay? And you gotta look at this as a system and the interplay which sometimes are highly nonlinear, and trying to model that, you can do, you can linearize it with small scale, but gigaton, the expect, the, the, what it produces could be quite unpredictable. And so we really got to look at this in a holistic way as much as possible, which means look at the modeling, look at the theories, look at the, and various uh, kinds of models at different resolutions. That's number one. The second one is given that so much of CO2 is absorbed by photosynthesis and then it goes back, how do we tweak that to keep more of the carbon in on Earth? And one of the things that we recommended was could we create crops? Crops are very important, annual crops, because they grow every year. And they grow every year because they absorb CO2. If you have a fully uh, grown forest, uh, forest, the net carbon is actually quite low because it is fully grown. And so annual crops, which has a, there's an economic benefit to that, could we grow crops with slightly higher photosynthetic efficiency without using water and fertilizer and with deeper roots? The reason the carbon goes back is the roots are shallow and they get broken down by organisms and the CO2 goes back. So if you can find, if you can use all the CRISPR-Cas9 and other things to develop seeds and plants that can have deeper roots with higher lignin content, that carbon that is absorbed for growing food can stay in the soil for a much longer time. And that is, and if even if 1% difference will make a massive difference in terms of atmospheric CO2. So that was the second thing. Um, advanced EOR, mostly today enhanced oil recovery, is used to produce oil and use as little CO2 as possible. Can we flip that around 
can we use CO2 to produce oil so that you have an economic benefit, but actually have a net negative impact so that you store more carbon than what you produce? Um, synthetic transformations of CO2. Uh, can you split water to produce hydrogen? Because if you want to do anything with, with CO2, uh, you got to need hydrogen if you want to make chemicals and, and, and fuels out of this. And there's a lot of energy cost in splitting water, and that energy better be carbon free. And the metric for that is that if you want to produce at 2 to $3 a gallon, you need energy at less than $30, carbon free energy at less than $30 a megawatt hour, and we are there. So the, the boundary conditions are about right. And then, of course, a low cost of carbon capture. This is what I was talking about. Water splitting reaction, one of the most important reactions. This is some of the, at least one of my research projects is on this. So you've got water out here. You, if you want to produce hydrogen at $2 a kilogram, which is what is needed, you need energy at $30 a megawatt hour. That's just the thermodynamics of water splitting. And that determines your cost. And today we are getting there. And because today we are producing at $5 a kilogram. And so how can we go less than two? Because you need the hydrogen to turn CO2 into any hydrocarbon you, you want. I and mean, that technology is known. The missing piece out here is carbon-free hydrogen. This is very important. The other way, and this is some amazing innovation that I got to see at RPE that I'd like to share with you, is the following. A lot of people are looking at how do you convert solar energy into fuels? And the way people are thinking about it is the following. Well, you make biofuels. You have, either you have sugar cane or you have uh, you know, various kinds of uh, plants, uh, grasses or corn, um, and you turn that into various kinds of biofuels. Or you have algae that you can turn into biodiesel or some kind of other advanced fuel. What is common out here is that these, are, these all rely on photosynthesis. And photosynthesis, the way the carbon flux moves, is something called the Calvin-Benson cycle. This is Melvin Calvin got the Nobel Prize for this uh, at Berkeley. There's a, there used to be a Calvin Hall. And this is the Calvin-Benson cycle. All photosynthesis uses that. And that's just a pathway for carbon. And it turns out the enzymes in these pathways are not that efficient. And so the efficiency of photosynthesis from photons to chemical bonds is less than 1%. People debate it's 0.1 or 0.2, but let's just say it's less than 1%. And which is why, if you want to make biofuels, a lot of the cost goes into big areas, land and water, and collecting that biomass and producing is expensive. And it's primarily, just like in solar cell, efficiency matters. So we asked the question, are there other ways? This is an RPE. Are there other ways? And, and by the way, there's a lot of investment that already went into this. We asked the question, are there other ways? Well, you can take sunlight and somehow do chemical catalysis. And there's, people have been trying this for a long time. And what we explored is a different way of using biology. So it turns out, and let me explain this, we call this, we actually created a new term called electrofuels. And people thought this was impossible. And here's the idea, that if you look at photosynthesis, yeah, I said it's the Calvin-Benson cycle. There are many organisms on this earth that don't see sunlight, but they still make carbon-carbon bonds. And these are extremophiles that live in the deep ocean vents that don't see any sunlight. They get their energy from hydrogen sulfide or oxidizing iron from plus two to plus three, and they get that electron, and they live on that electron, and they make carbon-carbon bonds. And they, they, they do not follow Calvin-Benson cycle. They follow other cycles, reverse Krebs cycle, called something called woods Longdahl cycle. I want, you know, these are all the cycles that were known. But all the biofuels work had gone into photosynthetic work. We said that let's try out other carbon-carbon making cycles where the food is not sunlight, but food could be anything. Redox reactions of iron, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, which is a waste product in oil and gas, because these cycles are known to be more than 10% efficient in making carbon-carbon bonds. The enzymes are better. 
And so we said, let's try this. And the scientific community, we brought the extremophile community, we brought the synthetic biology community, and the biofuels community together. They had not really spoken to each other. And we said that, is there, some, is there a there there? And they said, maybe. And there are organisms whose genomes were known, but the genetic manipulations were not known at that time. So we said, let's put that science as part of this program. We'll do science when it needed to, but with the goal of making biofuels. And this was creating an entirely new learning curve, which was the goal of RPE. And what happened was that you know, you could, now your feedstock is all of this. These are the energy sources. The second part is fixing the carbon uh, through reverse, you know, a Krebs cycle, Calvin-Benson cycle. These are all the other cycles that had never been used. And then to create hydrocarbons and to make fuels. So people thought this is a long shot, but we said give it a try. And within two years, they created oil, a biofuels. This is a combination of not NC State, and OPX biotechnology, this is the first vial of oil, a biofuel without sunlight. And this is in the second year, and the third year, I had a flask. And I said, I need a flask because this is scale now. I can handle it. And they actually put that oil inside a jet engine, and it worked. And I said, this is amazing. This is an entirely new pathway which had never been explored before. Yes, today it's expensive, but we can make it cheaper if you do the right reactor design, et cetera. So this is the kind of thing when it doesn't violate any laws of physics, it connecting two or three different fields, you bring them together and some magic happens. And that's the opportunity that we should be really looking at very, very actively in research. And you know, when people say, you know, this will never work, you gotta ask the question, does it violate any laws of thermodynamics? Does it violate any laws of mechanics, quantum mechanics, or classical mechanics, or electromagnetics? If it does not, then you evaluate whether it really works or not. So uh, let me end my talk by, you know, so, sort of my view of when people say this is not going to work. You've got to look at physics first, any laws of nature. Other than that, here are some examples of, of infamous or famous predictions from the past. This is Lord Kelvin in the 1890s who said that radio has no future, x-rays will prove to be a hoax, and heavier than air flying machines are impossible. He was very opinionated, <laughs> but he was dead wrong. Because it didn't, you know, existence proof existed with birds, but he didn't quite believe that. He was so convincing that he convinced Wilbur Wright, who in 1901 claimed that man will not fly for 50 years. Luckily, he had a brother. <laughs> <laughs> and in a matter of a few years, they were flying machines, you know? Then, then they were the ones who did this. So I think the best way to predict the future, or at least think about the future, is a quote for, from Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. And it is for you all, the students, to do some magic in the world, because that is what is needed. And you need to do it fast, because I'll end my talk with a quote from Martin Luther King. We are now faced with the fact that the tomorrow is today. We're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. Thank you. a few minutes for just a few quick questions and then I'd like to present the gift from the school and we'll adjourn to a reception outside with Dr. Majumder where there will be plenty of opportunity for discussion. Did I just cut off all discussion by saying only one or two quick questions? Surely someone will have a question or two from a student preferable. Yes. We're talking about the electricity in few, most, most cases. But if you look at sunlight, for example, it's an incredibly, incredibly broad spectrum. And uh, it's a very high temperature light source that we all very seldomly get on Earth, right? So is, 
is there a better way, more innovative way of utilizing that energy that we never thought about? Oh, you know, in solar energy. Right. Oh, there were, we saw a lot of ideas that I think there were some programs created of how do you use the visible part and the near infrared part of the spectrum for photovoltaics and the mid to far infrared part of the spectrum for photothermal. And, uh, and hybrid devices to bring down the total cost, et cetera. So I think RP, this is after I frankly left, yeah. that they created some programs on that. And that really to, to see how you can increase the overall efficiency, because if you think of the sun at 5,800 Kelvin, that's your black body temperature, and the earth at 300 Kelvin, and, and this is essentially a heat engine, yeah. right? At T, hot temperature and low temperature, if you do the number, your overall, the theoretical limit of the efficiency is about 94%. Exactly. We're not even close to that, right? right. And so, yeah, so the hybrid devices were discussed, um, yeah. So we always, you know, in photovoltaics, people always think of Shockley quasar limit as the theoretical limit. Well, that's a single band gap device. Exactly. But we don't have, we have, the real limit is 94%, yeah. Yes. So uh, you said that, well, th first off, great talk. Thank you so much. Um, you said that you wish that you were a student because you sort of look out at all of these big problems that can solve, uh, that can be solved. I guess as a student that's sort of getting towards the end of my academic career and looking ahead towards what's next, um, do you have any words of wisdom for how we should look at what look like a lot of very big problems and, and how, I guess, to find a little piece that we can break off to sort of pursue our own niche and how to solve this? Are you a graduate student out yes. here? Yes, yeah, PhD. Let me just say the first job of a graduate student is to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice, thank you. But on a more serious note, you know, there are, you know, when people say, okay, what things should we work on? There's, energy is not one thing, as you just saw. There are many different things. What's your background? Uh, biofuels. Oh, uh, terrific. So I was just telling some of the people today that the pendulum on biofuels has swung the <laughs> yeah. way that, you know, people, because the biofuels couldn't make it because the oil price came down, the, you know, there's not much funding. This is the time where there's some, you know, we're in the golden age of biology today. And all the discoveries that are being made, whether it's gene editing or other virus and microbiology, et cetera, if we could use that to look at plants, for example, as I was saying, um, either to have a negative emissions using crops or to make biofuels in a much cheaper way. Because I think the investment in biofuel in making plants were, were, was with technologies that frankly didn't work that well. And the investments were not that great. This is the time to step back and really look at new science and engineering in ways that could re-engineer the plant uh, or non-plants or organisms to make biofuels in a cheaper, much more sustainable way. So I would say this is the time, if that's your background, look at that. Look at the new tools that are coming out, which are being developed, fundamental science, some of them apply to health. Well, you could apply to this. Cool. Thank you. There's a, is there a hand in the back? We'll take one final question. Thank you for the talk. I had a question about uh, what have been the challenges for coming up with innovative business models from in the energy sector coming from the bottom-up approach? Because early on, you had a slide which mapped out the population with the lights, and you can see a lot of lights not being in the developing countries. So the question is, I'm sorry, the question is uh, the challenges of uh, startups in the, in the energy sector. So, you know, um, right now, as you, some of you may have heard, Bill Gates put this uh, Breakthrough Energy Coalition together to bring a lot of uh, billionaires to put some money. Now they've created something called the Breakthrough Energy Ventures. I'm involved in sort of helping them. And what they're looking at is a different kind of a venture model. Because the venture companies and, and we in the Bay Area, I live right literally walking distance to all this Sand Hill Road where they want to get 5X in five years and get out, right? And you could do that with software companies and all that. It's very hard to do that uh, for energy companies. 
you need to have a long-term view on this. And they're trying to create this venture company to have that long-term view, but to be global in perspective. So just to give you an example, if you look at food security, food and energy are related. If you look at food security, uh, or food prices, or the food supply chain in India, for example, 40 to 50% of the food is wasted from the farmers who are growing the food to the consumers because there's no refrigeration in the system. Now, that's not a problem of the United States. It's a problem over there. What's the business model? What's the technology uh, that you need? Who are the players? How do you fit in? How do you create value for the supply chain? Who do you disrupt? Who do you enable? All of those things have not been sorted out. People are, I'm, I'm advising a startup company which is trying to do that. And there are many, many such examples like that because the needs out there, the power reliability is pretty crappy, right? So how do you enable people to have the power reliability given the infrastructure is not quite providing that. So that's the kind of thing. And today they burn diesel. And I think we can do better than that today, right? But the diesel cartel will go after you. What would you do then? There are issues with that, societal issues that you got to deal with. And so the, the challenges of that part of the world or other parts of the world are very different from out here. And I think we need to take that global view. So with apologies to others who had their hands up, I'd like to bring the question and answer session to a close by thanking our speaker by prevent, presenting him, not preventing, but presenting him <laughs> with the gift of the Admiral Thayer School of Engineering. So Dr. Arun Majumdar has spoken passionately and eloquently about the future of energy. In one such future, which I noticed was divided on, I believe, slide 29 in his presentation, <laughs> Synthetic Transformations of CO2, Humanity produces sustainable oil using nothing but carbon dioxide, water, and renewable energy. This gift, which was conceived and created by Jeremy Faludi, who's a UC Berkeley PhD grad and new member of our faculty as of and, a month and ago. Rob Halverson here. Right. And thank you, Jeremy. I was getting to that. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so our recent graduate and design fellow is meant to embody that future. Oh. So the Thayer School. Thank you, of course, of course. I am in. With that kind of intrigue and suspense, I got to open this. Aha. What is this? Robert, Jeremy. So the idea is that that's not oil inside of it, molecule CO2, H2O. Oh, that is fabulous. Oh, yeah, and now I see it. <laughs> this is the CO2 molecule. There are two water molecules, right? And, oh, that's terrific, and that's oil. Oh, that's so thoughtful. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.